Hey, y'all, Scott here. Check out Jacob Hornberger's great new book, The CIA Terrorism and the Cold War, The Evil of the National Security State. They swear we need them, but the Future Freedom Foundation's Hornberger is having none of it. Hornberger shows how from the beginning, empire has diminished Americans' freedom far more than our enemies ever could. And all while undermining everything we profess to believe in and dealing with other nations. The CIA Terrorism and the Cold War, The Evil of the National Security State by Jacob Hornberger. Get it on Kindle for just a dollar at Amazon.com. All right, y'all, Scott Horton Show. I'm him. Uh, sign up for the podcast feed at scotthorton.org. Check out the archives there. More than 4,000 of them now going back to 2003. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. Introducing Nick Terse, and uh, he is a very important American journalist, uh, a very unique one, uh, really uh, doing as much work as everyone else combined, basically, on America's somewhat clandestine invasion of Africa. His uh, previous book is Tomorrow's Battlefield, and the brand new one is called Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead, War and Survival in South Sudan. Uh, he is a managing editor at Tom Engelhart's site, TomDispatch.com, and is a contributing writer to The Intercept. Welcome back to the show, Nick. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, Scott. Uh, very happy to have you back here. Uh, you do really great work. I really appreciate your time. Um, and, and this article, man, uh, I guess go ahead and, and give us the background to, uh, your stay, your, your time in, in South Sudan and in writing this book and all that. And then I guess by way of telling that story, you know, uh, provide us a little bit of the background of, um, the civil war there and how South Sudan was broken away from the North and, and, uh, the development since then, just in a general kind of catch us up sort of sense, if you could. Sure. I'll do my best. Uh, you know, South, uh, South Sudan, the Southern, the Southern part of the, the nation of Sudan has been trying to break away from the North, uh, since the 1950s. And there were two, uh, brutal civil wars, one from 1955 to 1972. Uh, that cost about uh, half a million lives. And then that civil war sort of reignited in 1983 and lasted until 2005. Uh, you know, over those 20-plus years, uh, I think another 2 million or so people died. No one knows exactly how many. Uh, so, you know, on the ground there was, there was a battle by uh, southern Sudanese uh, to break free of the North. Now, uh, this was seen in the United States in many ways as a fight against, of, uh, of Christians uh, against Muslims, and there's a, there is a, a large amount of truth to that. So uh, because of that, uh, there was a sort of a bipartisan coalition in the United States that, uh, that developed uh, to support the Southern Sudanese. Uh, one major part of it was uh, uh, evangelical Christians. In fact, uh, George W. Bush's uh, church in, in Midland, Texas, was a was a real driver in this. And then there were also, um, you know, some people in the, in the Carter administration actually, uh, who who were also, uh, for their own reasons, behind the creation of of, uh, of an independent state of South Sudan. So, you know, for for more than two decades. Uh, uh, People in America were, were agitating for this new country while the southern Sudanese were, were fighting for their independence. Uh, and it all came to fruition in 2011 uh, when uh, South Sudan, uh, as a result of a, a, a peace deal and a referendum, uh, became its, its, uh, an, its own independent nation. And it's, uh, it still is the, uh, the youngest, the newest country on earth. And... You know, it, it, there was a lot of optimism in 2011. A lot of people uh, in the United States thought that, that uh, this new nation could stand on its own. And in South Sudan, a lot of people uh, hoped that, you know, 50 years of war was behind them. And I wasn't watching very closely, uh, but, you know, I sort of kept an eye on South Sudan. And then I, I watched in uh, 2013 as this country basically fell apart, uh, collapsed in the Civil War. And, you know, I wondered what, what happened. Uh, I knew this was America's uh, nation-building effort in Africa. I'd seen what happened in nation-building efforts elsewhere in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but this was a very different situation. 
Uh, I knew the United States had poured billions of dollars in, uh, put a lot of time and effort into uh, into keeping the, the young nation afloat, and I wanted to figure out what went wrong. I couldn't really find good reports on it, so I decided uh, that I'd go take a look myself. So I went, uh, you know, the, the country uh, collapsed into civil war in December 2013. I went in 2014, spent a, a couple weeks there, and realized that, uh, you know, I, I, I started to get a sense of what happened, but, but uh, I, I knew I needed uh, more time there. So in 2015, I spent uh, a couple of months on the ground uh, going around interviewing, trying to figure out what had happened uh, and what might happen uh, going forward. I went to write a few articles, but uh, sort of what poured out of me was, was this new book, Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead. Right on. Well, I can't wait to read it. I'm sorry. I haven't got my hands on it yet. But um, And I'm sorry, I forgot to say the name of the newest article here at uh, The Intercept. It's Hillary Clinton's State Department gave South Sudan's military a pass for its child soldiers. So I guess we can get to that part in a minute there. But I want to go back over uh, a couple of things you mentioned. First of all, did you say that the the religious identification of we should support Christians over there, that a big hotbed of that political activism is coming out of Midland, Texas. Did I hear you right about that? That's right. Uh, because, of course, that's an oil town, which raises the question whether that's just cover, but are there even American oil companies involved over there? I know oil is part of the strategy of geopolitics and whatever, but as far as Texan corporate uh, economic interests, are they even at play? Or this that's really, you meant what you said there. Well, I mean, the the, the, the Christian aspect was was a main driver of it, but uh, but there always has been uh, an oil component to it. Uh, you know, it's it's not that shocking when it comes to the United States and and, and foreign policy that there's uh, oil involved. You know, back uh, in uh, the the 1970s, um, after the the first uh, civil war between the the, the Southerners and uh, and the government in Khartoum in the north of Sudan. Uh, once that they had come to a, uh, a, a peace deal that, that temporarily ended that war, it was actually uh, uh, George H.W. Bush, who was uh, uh, then the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, who uh, traveled to Sudan to let them know that uh, the U.S. satellites showed there was a, a major uh, deposit of oil uh, sitting uh, uh, underneath Sudan. You uh, don't say... But the, the problem for the North was they had just concluded a peace deal with the South that said uh, the South would have more autonomy, uh, remain part of Sudan, but they would have the mineral rights uh, to what was beneath their soil. Uh, and uh, George H.W. came to town and told them, you know, good news, we found oil, but the, the bad news was it was beneath the South of Sudan. So that meant the Southerners would, uh, would benefit from that oil. And, uh, and the northern government, Khartoum, uh, wasn't that happy about that and decided they would redraw the map uh, so that the oil deposit was back underneath their territory. And this is what really inflamed uh, tensions and led to the second civil war that started in, in 1983. So the United States uh, oil interests, they all had their, their fingerprints on this war from the get-go. Uh, it was Chevron that actually went in and, and started uh, working the oil fields there. But, uh, you know, once that, that second civil war started in the, in the 1980s, uh, you know, Chevron's uh, uh, oil interest there sort of fell apart. And, you know, once the, the United States uh, helped secure, you know, South Sudan uh, independence in, in the 2000s, it looked like U.S. oil companies might get in there, but uh, you know, it turned out that uh, it, was, it was Chinese companies that, that ended up getting the, the oil concessions there. Uh, as has happened before, the United States poured in a, in a lot of money and assistance, uh, and this has happened elsewhere in the world, that the, the Chinese were, were savvy enough to, to figure out how to actually get the mineral concessions. And this is what ultimately happened in, in South Sudan. Well, you know... I guess I had the mythology all wrong. I thought the story went that the Chinese were developing the oil resources under agreement with the government of the North, and that was such a big part of the reason why the CIA wanted to break off the South in the first place was to kick the Chinese out and make sure that 
you know, if not, um, if not, you know, Texas companies, at least, you know, Western companies were there for the Pentagon's strategic purposes that in the event of a crisis, we can cut the Chinese off from their oil, that kind of thing. But you're saying, well, what exactly? That either backfired or, or I had that wrong in the first place? Well, it was, it was Chevron that went in first uh, after, after Chevron decided to pull out because of the instability. Then uh, Chinese uh, firms had, had moved in and overtook those concessions. Uh, and yeah, so so that's how it went. It was it was ended up seeming too unstable for for the the Western companies. Uh, so I I think that's why. And then where's the actual secession in that timeline, though? Is what I'm asking. Yeah, uh, you know, Chevron basically gave up uh, on this in the in the 1980s, uh, and while the civil war was was raging, then. Uh, uh, that war ended in 2005, mm-hmm. and the, the Chinese came in after that. I see. And then, but they're still there, even though the U.S. succeeded in breaking off South Sudan from North Sudan, or other Sudan, or whatever, in, <laughs> uh, in uh, the last few years. The Chinese never left? The Chinese uh, didn't leave, and the Chinese have uh, been very savvy about uh, figuring out a way to protect their oil interests there. Uh, again, they've sort of... Uh, Put one over on the United States uh, during the the, you know, the last the, or the current civil war, depending on how you want to call it, the one that began in 2013. Uh, you know, this of course was a was a threat to Chinese oil companies, and they were able to expand the United Nations mandate for protection in in South Sudan. Uh, the UN uh, was obliged to protect civilians. Uh, Protect, you know, some some uh, you know, various sites around the country, and the Chinese worked uh, the the oil fields into that deal. They inserted language uh, in the UN resolutions uh, that allowed protection of the oil uh, interests there, and then the Chinese uh, sent their own infantry battalion uh, under the auspices of the United Nations, you know, wearing basically blue helmets uh, to protect those installations. Now the the United States pays about uh, 25 to 30 percent of the uh, UN peacekeeping budget, so in effect the Chinese were able to get uh, the United States to underwrite a Chinese infantry battalion going in to protect Chinese oil interests, uh, doing it under the auspices of the United Nations. Unbelievable. All right, so uh, tell us more about this civil war. Then who's who in South Sudan and why they hate each other so bad? Well. Uh, you know the the, uh, the civil war that that raged from 1983 to uh, to 2005. At that time, the the southern Sudanese were, were led by a, a, a leader named John Garang, who was a uh, an American uh, educated PhD uh, who hailed from from southern Sudan and a, and a military officer there. And he was killed uh, just after the end of that civil war in a, uh, a helicopter crash. Still very murky. And the two men that were uh, the, the highest-ranking subordinates underneath him were Salva Kiir, uh, who's currently the president of South Sudan, and Riek Machar, who uh, was Kiir's uh, vice president. Uh, Kiir fired him from that job, and these two men were the ones who, uh, you know, uh, were the, the, the primary drivers of the, uh, the civil war that began in, in 2013. It was uh, Kier's presidential guard tried to disarm uh, uh, guard soldiers who were uh, loyal to Riek Machar. Kier is from the uh, largest tribe in the country, the Dinka, and Machar is from the second largest tribe, the Nuer. And uh, it, became, it was a, began as a battle between uh, Dinka soldiers and Nuer soldiers, and then these Dinka troops that are loyal to Kier uh, went out to the streets of the capital, South Sudan, Juba, and started killing not only uh, New Air troops, but also uh, New Air civilians, massacring them in the streets. And from there, the civil war spread throughout the country. You had uh, sort of uh, tit-for-tat uh, massacres elsewhere. Uh, New Air uh, troops loyal to Mashar uh, killing Dinka civilians elsewhere in the country. And 
from December 2013 until August 2015, the Civil War raged. Then a peace deal went into effect, and uh, just recently, in the last couple months, uh, they formed a unity government, which again has Kier uh, still holding the presidency, and Mashar back as his vice president. Now, uh, the peace deal's holding, I think, basically because uh, neither of these men could afford to fight anymore. Uh, at least for the the moment, but uh, you know none of the underlying causes of the civil war, uh, the ethnic tensions, the uh, the personal uh, animus between Kier and, and Mashar, none of that has gone away. Uh, basically, all that's changed is somewhere between fifty thousand and three hundred thousand people were killed. Uh, many atrocities were uh, committed, and the government went from um, you know having. Uh, very little economic stability to none at all. Uh, they're basically broke. The, the, even the future earnings on oil have been mortgaged away to, to pay for the, the civil war. So the country's in much worse shape than it was before. Uh, none of the underlying issues of the civil war have been addressed, uh, but these two men are, are back, uh, you know, sort of tied together in this uh, unity government that I don't think anyone expects uh, to be a long-term solution. That's oh, amazing. Well, yeah, I mean, it's incredible that they went back to the old status quo with the old vice president coming back and everything. But right. so what could be done then to heal over the differences? I mean, obviously, we're talking about two major, you know, they at least consider ethnic or tribal distinctions here. Um Maybe back when the British or the Dutch or whoever drew those lines should have drawn them in different places, whatever it is. But could they, I don't know, pump enough oil out of the ground to make everybody rich enough that they kind of quit hating each other? Or any? Do you see any real basis of future negotiation here? You know, it's 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 very difficult. Uh, you know, you you mentioned that that oil wealth, and this was uh, this was the great hope when uh, at the time of independence in, in 2011. You know, South Sudan is is a small country, uh, and a lot of people thought that. This finally was uh, was an African nation uh, that uh, that wouldn't fall to the resource curse. That they had seen this play out enough times in Africa to know that you you need to hold on to your your uh, you know oil wealth, your mineral wealth, and that uh, you know because oil prices were so high at the time and and just headed upwards from there that uh, that the, the country would be able to sort of pay its way to. Uh, uh, to, to a real lasting peace and independence. You know, now oil prices have fallen to the point that, uh, you know, for, for South Sudan to pump oil out of the ground and then uh, send it by pipeline north because they don't have their own refining facilities, it has to go to to the north, to the, the nation of Sudan. Uh, it's actually costing them money to do that. They're, they're losing money on every barrel that they're uh, sending out now. So, uh, oil is no longer a, a solution for the country, and you know I think there is a, a, a chance at uh, you know lasting peace, but only if there's real accountability in South Sudan. Only if there's you know, leg- a legitimate peace and, and uh, reconciliation process that also holds people accountable. You have two men at the top of the government who are uh, you know by by any stretch of the imagination uh, at least would be tried for war crimes. Um, and, you know, if you, you read United Nations reports, it spells it out uh, pretty clearly that uh, they'd likely be found guilty of these crimes. I think, you know, most of the people I talked to in South Sudan said they needed accountability. Uh, if that didn't exist, there would always be uh, people in the country who are looking for revenge. And it's a country with a lot of weaponry uh, and a lot of, a lot of men who all they know is is guerrilla warfare. So, uh, you know, most people told me that that if there wasn't real accountability, if leaders weren't held responsible for the crimes they've committed, uh, there was going to be war. So having these two men in the top spots, I don't think there's any chance for peace. There is, you know, if you can get a new generation of leaders and uh, and you can assuage some of this uh, desire for revenge. Mm-hmm. Well, but it would have to be not just war crimes trials for 
those guys, but for our side too, that's where the real rub comes in, right? Where if, if it was, like you say, uh, a real fair and honest truth and reconciliation type of thing where war criminals on all sides were held accountable, but it sounds like it could just instead be a step to further, you know, uh, Motives for revenge down the line, so to speak. You know, victor's justice and that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that's the the real danger. You know, you'd, you'd really have to, you know, I, I think you'd have to be completely, you know, honest and, and upfront about this. And this has never been a strong suit of, of South Sudan nor uh, the countries, including the United States, that uh, that have, you know, backed uh, the country or, or various sides uh, in the civil war. Mm. Well, and and speaking of the bad blood, how many hundreds of thousands of people did you say were killed in this thing? Yeah, no one knows for sure. Uh, you know, some of the aid agencies said uh, 50,000 had been killed and sort of stopped counting. And that was back in 2014. Uh, uh, but so the, one another at, year after that, at least, right? Yeah, the estimates go up to as many as 300,000. Uh, the problem is there's there's really uh, there just hasn't been any good way to, to try and keep count. A lot of the fighting uh, went on far from uh, uh, you know any outside observers, and it's it's been very difficult. Uh, you know, in a, in a country where there are no birth records, no death records, uh, to keep uh, you know any sort of count on on what's gone on. There's there's one little civil society group there called uh, Remembering the Ones We've Lost which is doing some heroic work in trying to, to count the numbers of, of dead, um, you know, by name uh, through uh, press reports and then going out and interviewing people and trying to corroborate uh, stories, you know, person by person during the Civil War. It's, uh, it's some amazing work, and, and you know, there, uh, I've, I've never seen anything quite like that. Uh, they only have 5,000 people i say only but you know on, the, on their list right now but uh you know they they said they're they're committed to this whether it's 50,000 or, or 300,000 uh to try and name every person that's been killed in this war but of course that'll take many years you know decades uh you know if, if they're ever able to get to those those high levels yeah well you know i read all of your stuff at tom dispatch and and the intercept and wherever and I read some of these about, you know, the story of the guy hiding in the swamp and some of this other stuff uh, that you've reported out of there. It sounds like just an absolute nightmare. Worst kind of, you know, nothing like a battlefield, right? Just massacres unending, huh? Yeah, that's really been the, the hallmark of, of that war. Of course, modern warfare is, is often like this, where it's uh, it's civilians that, that pay the, the ultimate price. But in, in, uh, in South Sudan, there were very few battles between armed troops. It's really been, uh, you know, the story of the, the, the Civil War for, for either side of it has been, uh, you know, armed, men armed with, with AK-47s descending on um, villages uh, just packed with civilians and carrying out uh, killings, uh, you know, sometimes raising the whole village to the ground, massacres, gang rapes. Uh, it's, it's really uh, just a, a horrendous war that's that's been uh targeted only at at civilians you know on this i i came back from from south sudan of well i guess uh about a month and a half two months ago now and i i went to a town called lear or i should say what's left of the town uh most of it is just ruins now uh just these uh little rectangles or, or circles of uh of mud you know, waddle walls where homes used to be. Uh, last year, from April until November, uh, militias that were allied to the government just fell upon Lear uh, in waves again and again and uh, raised the, the entire community to the ground, uh, sent many people from there uh, fleeing into uh, into rebel territory for safety. And uh, those who, who weren't, uh, most of them were, were killed. A lot of the women were uh, taken away as sex slaves, where they were, uh, you know, gang raped and then just uh, left to try and fend for themselves in in nearby swamps. A lot of people ran there for for safety, and they lived basically, uh, you know, all day long, you know, up to their 
uh, chest or their neck in water, uh, you know, deep inside the swamp, and then they would try and come out at night and forage for food. Uh, you know, I, I found some of the survivors there who were dressed in, in rags because um, soldiers had taken everything that they, they had, all their belongings, and they were still coming at night, uh, these armed militiamen, to steal anything they had left. Often that was only clothes that were on uh, their children's backs. Uh, so a lot of the, the children I saw had, had no clothes left. Soldiers had come in the night and even taken children's clothes. I mean, this is what you know the, the population there was reduced to. They were eating uh, uh, water lily bulbs. It was the, the only food that, that they had left, and they were you know desperate for, for any kind of uh, uh, sustenance to be brought in. When I was there, uh, aid groups, uh, international NGOs were just starting to, to come back to Lear because their compounds had also been attacked and, and looted by these militiamen. It was, um, you know, one of the, the worst scenes I, I ever saw, just uh, to see this town completely wiped out. And, you know, I even walked down into a field where there were just human remains just left out. Uh, you know, South Sudanese generally bury their dead, but, um, you know, these were, were people that were uh, abducted by the government and killed and dumped there. And, People didn't even want to go and, and try and reclaim the bodies for fear that they would run afoul of uh, government troops. So it was just a field of, of uh, spinal columns and femurs and, uh, and skulls just out in the open. I'd, uh, I'd never come across anything like that. Just, uh, you know, just a horrific scene all around. All right. So where's Obama, Hillary Clinton and the CIA and all this? Well, you, you mentioned that... Uh, a new story of mine over at the intercept uh and this was uh you know it, it, it's sort of a microcosm of, of how things have gone for for the united states and, and south sudan uh you know the the u.s you know through intermediaries had uh pumped a lot of money and also a lot of weapons into into south sudan during the the civil war from 1983 to 2005 uh as they championed the southern cause and then uh, in the time before independence in the 2000s and then afterwards uh, in 2011 until the Civil War in 2013, the United States poured a lot of money into to South Sudan, billions of dollars, including uh, hundreds of millions into the, uh, the military there, known as the SPLA, the Sudan People's Liberation Army. And uh, you know, the, the, the U.S. supported this uh, this army in, in South Sudan, even though they knew that uh, the army carried out uh, atrocities on a regular basis. The State Department's own reports said that year after year. And even though they employed child soldiers, uh, there's a, uh, a law in the United States, the Child Soldiers uh, Prevention Act, which bars uh, the U.S. from providing uh, military assistance to foreign armies that, uh, that employ child soldiers. But the U.S. used a, a technicality uh, in 2011 to keep the, the flow of money to the SPLA going. And then in 2012 and 2013, it was uh, Hillary Clinton's State Department that, uh, that drafted waivers uh, for President Obama. And uh, President Obama uh, sent these waivers on to, to Congress, and it allowed uh, U.S. aid to keep flowing into uh, the, the SPLA, the military that would go on to... Uh, uh, massacre, you know, who knows how many civilians uh, during this current civil war uh, and employ you know, somewhere around uh, 10 to 15,000 child soldiers uh, during the war. Uh, this was the, you know, this was our creation. We spent hundreds of million dollars building up this military, supposedly professionalizing it. Uh, and, uh, and, and this is what happened. And now, so there was controversy at the time about the legalization of the child soldiers and American NGOs complaining and things like that, right? That made no difference, huh? Right. Uh, you know, the, the, the NGOs that, that track this, Human Rights Watch and, uh, and others, you know, they kept uh, putting pressure on the Obama administration, kept saying that, uh, you know, by providing these waivers, uh, all you're doing is uh, entrenching the use of child soldiers and... Uh, and you know you're you're setting you know, a bad example for for other countries, and uh, and you're letting this military 
off the hook. The United States had leverage. It was giving all this money. It could have uh, twisted some arms there and, uh, you know, it, it seemed, and make the, the South Sudanese uh, demobilize its children. Uh, the United States said that it was doing this because uh, they wanted to keep supporting uh, you know, South Sudan's military and that the only way to, uh, uh, you know, to help it become a modern professionalized force was through engagement. You know, this is what they say all over the world, but if you look at uh, the other places that we provided waivers, uh, Yemen, Libya, uh, you know, all these countries uh, ended up collapsing into to civil war. Uh, each of their militaries uh, is uh, consistently cited for human rights abuses. Uh, you know, the, the, this, this type of engagement and, and looking the other way doesn't work over and over again. We see that in action. But, uh, you know, this is how the, the U.S. government operates. Uh, you know, it, 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 it picks those, uh, those militaries that it, it wants to support, and it won't be uh, constrained by, by anything, not even U.S. law. Yeah, man, and I'm looking at these pictures here, Nick, and uh, at theintercept.com. These are not 17-year-olds who really want to be in the Army. These are 10- and 11-year-old boys here. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I went up in, 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 uh, in 2015 on, on that trip. I went and interviewed child soldiers. Um, I recount it in, in Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead. And, you know, I'd, I'd go up to these kids and ask them what it was like to be a soldier or, or you know, what, it, what it's like to be a veteran because uh, I said, you know, I've, I've never served in the military. And I'm saying this to a, a, a boy who's, uh, who's 15 and just finished a, a three-year stint. So he was in from the age of 12. Uh, you have, you know, 9, 10, 11-year-olds uh, fighting for the, the government, for the, uh, uh, the opposition forces, or from other various militias that operate in the country. So very young boys, uh, often with, with little choice uh, but, to, but to join up. Uh, a lot of these boys told me that... Um, you know, they didn't want to be soldiers, but uh, government soldiers came to attack their, their village. Uh, so they wanted protection. Uh, so they went to a, a local militia, joined up. That militia eventually made peace with the government, and then they became government soldiers. So they were still, uh, they were still fighting. Now they were fighting in the, in the force that uh, was the one they were trying to escape from in the first place. It's a, a, a very messy situation, and now you have, um, you know, uh, during this civil war, somewhere around 15,000 brand-new child soldiers uh, from this war. And, you know, somehow these, these boys have to be demobilized and, uh, and you know, brought back into the civilian fold, and it's, it's not easy for them. You know, they've spent years as, as soldiers. This is, this is what they know. Uh, they told me that they wanted to, uh, they were hopeful for, for education, they wanted to go to school, but a lot of them couldn't afford it. You have to have to pay money in South Sudan for that. There's um, and 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 money is in short supply. You do great work, Nick. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Scott. I, I appreciate the work you do and uh, and and your support of my work all these years. Yeah, well, you certainly deserve it. Uh, unparalleled stuff here. Uh, the great Nick Terse, everybody. The latest book is called Next Time They'll Come to Count the Dead: War and Survival in South Sudan. Uh, before that, of course, was Tomorrow's Battlefield, U.S. Proxy Wars and Secret Ops in Africa. you got to read that thing. And before that, Kill Anything That Moves, The Real American War in Vietnam, which, okay, yeah, that's an old war, but that's a groundbreaking book on the subject of American war crimes in that war. You really need to read it. Check them out uh, at TomDispatch.com and TheIntercept.com. Thanks, y'all. Hey, and that's the Scott Horton Show. Check out the archives at scotthorton.org. More than 4,000 interviews going back to 2003. Sign up for the podcast feed there. Help support at scotthorton.org slash donate. And follow me on Twitter at Scott Horton Show. You hate government? One of them libertarian types? Or maybe you just can't stand the president, gun grabbers, or warmongers? Me too. That's why I invented LibertyStickers.com. Well, Rick owns it now, and I didn't make up all of them, but still, if you're driving around and want to tell everyone else how wrong their politics are, there's only one place to go. LibertyStickers.com has got your bumper covered. Left, right, libertarian, empire, police, state, founders, quotes, central banking. Yes, bumper stickers about central banking. Lots of them. And, well, everything that matters. LibertyStickers.com. Everyone else's stickers suck. Hey, I'll Scott Horton here to tell you about this great new ebook by longtime future freedom author Scott McPherson. 
freedom and security, the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms. This is the definitive principled case in favor of gun rights and against gun control. America is exceptional. Here the people come first, and we refuse to allow the state a monopoly on firearms. Our liberty depends on it. Get Scott McPherson's Freedom and Security, the Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms on Kindle at Amazon.com today. So you're a libertarian, and you don't believe the propaganda about government awesomeness you were subjected to in fourth grade. You want real history and economics. Well, learn in your car from professors you can trust with Tom Woods's Liberty Classroom. And if you join through the Liberty Classroom link at scotthorton.org, we'll make a donation to support The Scott Horton Show. Liberty Classroom, the history and economics they didn't teach you.